We've made it to Isaiah chapter 4. Possibly the most amazing book in the Bible. 66 chapters that line up with the 66 books of the Bible. Of course, we're going to see some things in Isaiah 4 that align up with the book of Numbers. So Isaiah, he's got so much prophecy that I don't see how anybody could think that the Old Testament is out of date. It's so up to date. Actually, we can't even catch up with it. In this chapter, he goes heavily into the millennial reign of the Lord Jesus. And sometimes he'll go back and forth from tribulation to millennium and then back to tribulation again. So you just got to look at the context, really look at it and see, or try to give your best guess sometimes about is this millennium or is this tribulation? So let's look at the millennial reign of the Lord Jesus and just see how just exciting it's going to be. In Isaiah 4.1, he says, and in that day. Now, once again, note the phrase, in that day. That puts you in a primarily in a tribulation, second coming, millennial reign context, prophetically. Now, obviously, what Isaiah is writing, the things he's writing is... It's got a historical application. It literally happened in history. But there's things that he writes that hasn't taken place yet. So therefore it's pushing you doctrinally, prophetically into the future. So it says, And in that day seven women shall take hold of one man, saying, We will eat our own bread and wear our own apparel. Only, le only let us be called by thy name to take away our approach. So seven women are going to take hold of just one man. So if you're having trouble getting a girlfriend, you're just living in the wrong time period. Because then in the at the end of the tribulation, there's going to be such a shortage of men from probably the wars and the catastrophes that went on. The women are going to outnumber the men seven to one. So seven women will go out there after one guy because they won't be able to take away their approach of not having any children or being able to get married. So in the Bible, when a woman didn't have children or couldn't have them, it was seen as a reproach. So they're like, only let us be called by thy name to take away our approach. Just like in Genesis 30, 22 through 23, it says, And God remembered Rachel, and God hearkened to her and opened her womb, and she conceived and bare a son and said, God hath taken away my reproach. So these women are wanting to have children and they're wanting to get married to take away their reproach. Similar to Hannah in 1 Samuel 1, 5 through 6, but unto Hannah he gave a worthy portion for he loved Hannah, but the Lord had shut up her womb and her adversary also provoked, provoked her sore for to make her fret because the Lord had shut up her womb. So you see it's, it was a reproach. So these desperate women in Isaiah 4, 1, will be so eager to have a husband that they will say to the man, we will eat our own bread and wear our own apparel. You won't even have to take care of us in that way. We'll take care of ourselves. Because, but you see, it's the man's job to make sure his wife has these things. Exodus 21.10 says, if he take him another wife, her food, her raiment, and her duty of marriage shall he not diminish. So, you see, it was, it's the man's job to take care of the woman. But these women here were so desperate, they were saying, you don't even have to buy our clothes, buy our food. We just, we'll take care of it. Just let us marry you and take your name. But today, you see women who want to be independent and not have to rely on a man for things. But it seems that God wants this responsibility to fall on the man to take care of the wife. So the verse shows that these women, obviously they're not looking for a lesbian relationship or they'd be in good shape. So that sex perverted utopia that a lot of the sodomites and lesbians are looking for today, it's not going to happen. God's not going to let that happen. But these women want to be called by thy name, it says. They want to take the man's name. 
just as God called the woman by the man's name. In Genesis 5, 2, it says, Male and female created he them and blessed them and called their name Adam in the day when they were created. You see, a woman won't be able to get around the fact that she has a man's name. And if she doesn't take her husband's name, she will still have her father's last name. Generally speaking, a woman who won't take the man's last name is showing some signs of rebellion, generally speaking, even at the beginning of the marriage, not even taking the man's last name. So the chapter begins here in verse 2 to start talking about the millennial reign of the Lord Jesus, one of my favorite topics in the Bible. And let's just talk about what it's going to be like. Number one, you're going to have an exalted Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Isaiah 4.2. Note the phrase again, in that day. In that day shall the branch of the Lord be beautiful and glorious, and the fruit of the earth shall be excellent and comely for them that are escaped of Israel. So note the phrase there, in that day, putting you in the millennial reign context. This covers a wide range of time because one day with the Lord is as a thousand years, so you got in that day, and one day with the Lord is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. It primarily refers to the second coming in the millennium. So in that day, the Lord alone will be exalted. He will be beautiful and glorious, as it says. Compare with the first coming, when he was made flesh, he didn't show up in a body with beauty. In Isaiah 53, 2, it says, For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. That was the first coming. But the second coming, the second time around, the Lord will be beautiful. He will be in his glorified body. And John lays it out well in Revelation chapter 1. What the Lord looks like in his glorified body. But the branch of the Lord, it says. The branch of the Lord will be beautiful and glorious. The branch of the Lord is Jesus Christ. Let me show you some verses that show you that the branch is Jesus. Isaiah 11.1 1. It says, And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. So you see that? Talking about it's going to be out of the stem of Jesse. Jesse, the father of David, Jesus Christ in the line of David, you see? Then Jeremiah 23, 5, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch, capital B once again, and a king, capital K, shall reign and prosper and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. Zechariah 3, 8, Hear now, O Joshua, the high priest, thou and thy fellows that sit before thee, for they are men wondered at. For behold, I will bring forth my servant, the branch. Capital B-R-A-N-C-H. Zechariah 6, 12, And speak unto him, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, Behold, the man whose name is the branch. Capital B. R-A-N-C-H again. And he shall grow up out of his place, and he shall build the temple of the Lord. So Jesus Christ is the branch. He's going to be the exalted Savior. The Lord alone will be exalted in that day. Everything will be about him. You're not going to have it all about the athletes and the musicians and the celebrities and people going to these concerts to worship their idols and going to the stadiums to worship their idols the lord alone will be exalted in that day the branch will be beautiful and glorious number two you'll have excellent fruit exalted savior excellent fruit isaiah 4 2 in that day shall the branch of the lord be beautiful and glorious and the fruit of the earth shall be excellent and comely for them that are accepted of israel Let's look at some verses to go along with this. Joel chapter 2, 
23 through 27. It says, Be glad then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he hath given you the former rain moderately, and he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain, and the latter rain in the first month. You see, after the second coming, from where everything's been burned up and destroyed, the Lord's going to cause a big rain to come. And this rain's going to restore everything back to it was. It'd be like a Garden of Eden-like conditions. And it says, And the floors shall be full of wheat, and the fats shall overflow with wine and oil. And I will restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten, the canker worm, and the caterpillar, and the palmer worm, my great army which I sent among you. And ye shall eat in plenty, and be satisfied, and praise the name of the Lord your God that hath dealt wondrously with you. And my people shall never be ashamed. And ye shall know that I am in the midst of Israel, and that I am the Lord your God, and none else. And my people shall never be ashamed. You see, he's going to be in the midst of Israel, showing this is a millennial reign. He says they shall eat in plenty and be satisfied. So you see, the fruit is going to be excellent. Plenty of food. No more famine like it was in the tribulation. This will be a much appreciated time after the events and famines of the tribulation time period. And it's just going to make them more appreciative of it. Going through that tribulation and then being there in the millennium. I mean, go without eating during intermediate fasting for a while. You appreciate the food a lot more when you start to eat. Look at Amos 9, 11 through 15. Amos 9, 11. In that day, once again the phrase, in that day will I raise up the tabernacle of David that is fallen and close up the breaches thereof, and I will raise up his ruins and I will build it as in the days of old, that they may possess the remnant of Edom and of, and of all the heathen which are called by my name, saith the Lord that doeth this. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, here it is, that the plowman shall overtake the reaper, and the treader of grapes, him that soweth seed, and the mountains shall drop sweet wine, and all the hills shall melt. So the plowman's going to overtake the reaper, the treader of grapes, him that soweth seed. And I will bring again the captivity of my people Israel, and they shall build the waste cities and inhabit them. And they shall plant vineyards and drink the wine thereof. They shall also make gardens and eat the fruit of them. And I will plant them upon their land. And they shall no more be pulled up out of their land, which I have given them, saith the Lord thy God. So you see the plowman overtakes the reaper, the treader of grapes, him that soweth seed. They're going to be building gardens. They're going to be eating the fruit of them. The fruit's going to be excellent. They're going to have so much fruit growing, they don't even, it's going to be hard for them to just keep up with how fast it's growing. Ezekiel 34, 29, he says, And I will raise up for them a plant of renown, and they shall be no more consumed with hunger in the land, neither bear the shame of the heathen any more. There's not going to be any hunger. You're not going to have to worry about commercials showing you starving kids in Africa and then you get the money and some rich guy gets it. It's not going to be like that. People's, there's going to be so much food. Things will grow so fast, it will be hard to pick it all. But those nations who don't come to Jerusalem to worship the king will see no rain. In Zechariah fourteen sixteen through 17, it says, And it shall come to pass that everyone that is left of all the nations which come up against Jerusalem shall even go up from year to year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. And it shall be that whoso will not come up of all the families in the earth unto Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, even upon them shall be no rain. So the millennium will be a time when you won't have to worry about a rich man, rich men, and big companies putting poisonous stuff in the food. You won't have to worry about the grocery store being stocked up. You don't have to worry about where your next meal is going to come from. Their fruit's going to be excellent. And the only people that's not going to have any is the people that don't come to worship the king because he's not going to let it rain on them if they don't. 
So you got an exalted Savior, excellent fruit. Next, you got escaped survivors, Isaiah 4.2. In that day, in that day, shall the brains of the Lord be beautiful and glorious. And the fruit of the earth shall be excellent and comely for them that are escaped of Israel. You're going to have a whole bunch of Jews that escaped the Antichrist and made it to the end of the tribulation without dying. The escaped of Israel. You know, in Mark 13, 14, he said, But when you shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing where it ought not, let him that readeth understand. Then let them that be in Judea flee to the mountains. See, they're going to be escaping the Antichrist. So you're going to have tribulation saints that make it all the way through the tribulation and go into the millennium. They are the escaped of Israel. But then you're going to have tribulation saints who escaped the temptations of the mark and endured those things associated with the Antichrist who didn't make it to the end of the tribulation without dying, but die, who died before the end of the tribulation, but yet they're resurrected and come back to be with the Lord to go into the kingdom. You could call them escape. They escaped a lot of things. They didn't give in to the temptations and things like that. But then you're also going to have a whole another group of saints, church-age saints. That's where me and you come in. We escape the blindness of the world. We escape the temptations that come along with trying to get you to reject Jesus Christ. We believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. And we will come down with the Lord to start the kingdom. So you can consider us as some escape survivors. You're also going to have the Old Testament saints living alongside all these saints as well. It's going to be heaven on earth with Jesus Christ reigning from Jerusalem. So you got escape survivors. And then you got everyone that is written among the living in Jerusalem called holy. So you got an exalted Savior. Excellent fruit, escaped survivors. Everyone that is written among the living in Jerusalem shall be called holy. Isaiah 4, 3, And it shall come to pass that he that is left in Zion and he that remaineth in Jerusalem shall be called holy, even everyone that is written among the living in Jerusalem. Now remember, the book of Numbers, fourth book of the Bible, Starts out with a big list of names in Numbers chapter 1. So once again, Isaiah chapter 4 can line up with the fourth book of the Bible. Because what is this talking about? Everyone written among the living in Jerusalem. So it's going to be chronicled out, laid out. Lay, and uh, The people that came in. Because, you know, God is a bookkeeper. He's a record keeper. So just like, why do you think Numbers is called the book of Numbers? It's numbering, getting the number of the people to go out to war. And then it's got a whole bunch, a list of names there. And there's going to be like a book showing you everyone written among the living in Jerusalem. So just like God always has a record of everyone... God chronicles things. He's a bookkeeper. Compare with Chronicles. People don't like to read Chronicles because of all the names, right? Or there's places in the scriptures where people don't like the names. But that just shows you God's record keeping. It should be a fearful thing how good God is at keeping record. Thankfully, he doesn't keep record of our sins anymore when it comes to our salvation. But he is a record keeper, a bookkeeper. And it says, everyone among the living in Jerusalem will be called holy. That's because Hebrews 8.10, For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, said the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. So he's going to put their laws in their mind. He's going to put his laws in their mind and write them in their hearts. You will have also church age saints and glorified bodies walking around who are completely sinless in a body like the Lord Jesus Christ. And the nations who survived the tribulation and the second coming who were good to the brethren, as it talks about in Matthew 25, they're still going to have some bad apples 
who don't like the Lord's reign. But for every bad apple, you're probably going to have a thousand saints. A thousand church age saints and glorified bodies who keep watch and control of any bad activity that could go on. I mean, your kids are going to be able to play in the street. Everyone written among the living in Jerusalem shall be called holy. Your kids can play in the street. You can leave your door open all night. Zechariah 8, 3 through 5 says, Thus saith the Lord, I am returned unto Zion and will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. And Jerusalem shall be called a city of truth. And the mountain of the Lord of hosts, the holy mountain. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, There shall yet old men and old women dwell in the streets of Jerusalem. And every man with his staff and his hand for very age. And the streets of the city shall be full of of boys and girls playing in the streets thereof. So you see, it's not going to be like it is now where <clears throat> Washington, D.C.'s crime, I just read, went up, has gone up 70%. And these people, these places want to defund the police and you just see crime going up so many percent, people robbing people, stabbing people, raping people. It's not going to be like that in the millennium. You're going to have the Lord up there with a rod of iron, ruling with a rod of iron. You're going to have millions of church-age saints in bodies like Jesus Christ patrolling the place. They're not going to be able to def defund us. And you're just going to have a, a perfect righteous reign by a perfect dictator, the Lord Jesus Christ. And there's going to be a lake of fire on earth in the millennium as a deterrent to crime. In Isaiah 66, when the people come to go to Jerusalem to worship during the Feast of the Tabernacles, they're going to look upon the carcasses of the men in that lake of fire, and it will be a deterrent to crime. Your kids will be able to play in the streets and not have to worry about getting picked up by some pervert in a van so that he can go sell them. So you're going to have everyone that is written among the living in Jer Jerusalem shall be called holy. You're going to have the Lord erase the filth and start clean. And Isaiah 4, 4, it says, When the Lord shall have washed away the filth of the daughters of Zion, and shall have purged the blood of Jerusalem from the midst thereof by the spirit of judgment and by the spirit of burning. So imagine what filth, sinful devices and pictures and wicked property was destroyed in Noah's flood. Think about all the wicked stuff the Lord got rid of with a flood. It will be like that at the second coming when the Lord arrives in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God. He is going to burn out all the wicked stuff in judgment. And that's what it's talking about, the spirit of burning and the spirit of judgment. Our God is a consuming fire. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. The Lord, of, the Lord is a man of war. He is a jealous God. And in Malachi 4, 1, it says, For behold, the day cometh, the day cometh, that shall burn as an oven. And all the proud, yea, and all that do wickedly shall be stubble. And the day that cometh shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts, and it shall leave them neither root nor branch. So the day's coming that's going to burn as an oven, the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, where he comes down with the spirit of burning, the spirit of judgment, and he's going to wash away the filth of the daughters of Zion. It's just like with your salvation. When you got saved, he washed away the filth and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Revelation 1.5 And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. When Jesus Christ was on the cross between the sixth and ninth hour, he took our hell. He became your sins and they were purged. That's your expiation. He took your hell. He became your sin and took your hell. And he took that burning, you see, when he was on the cross. And he's going to come down at the second coming. And he's going to clean things up with the spirit of judgment and with the spirit of burning. So he's and he's going to have extra protection at the millennium. There's going to be extra protection. 
Not only will the Lord be there himself, ruling with a lot of rod of iron, but you'll have millions of church age saints and glorified bodies patrolling the place. You'll have saints of all ages like Joshua, Caleb, Moses, Samson, Shema, Eliezer, King David, and many other mighty men. Imagine the army that we're going to have build up. You think about that. Joshua and Moses and Caleb and Samson and Shema and Eliezer and King David. All the the great war heroes of the scriptures, all there, with saints and glorified bodies and angels. You'll have, you're going to have also the Lord's flaming fire covering the dwelling place by night and a cloud and smoke covering it by day. In Isaiah 4, 5, it says, And the Lord will create upon every dwelling place of Mount Zion and upon her assemblies a cloud and smoke by day and the shining of a flaming fire by night, for upon all the glory shall be a defense. And the book of Numbers, once again, your fourth book of the Bible, talks about the cloud covering at least 20 different times. So that lines up with Numbers. And it says, Upon all the glory... You see, it's going to be a glorious place, a place defended by the Lord himself. Just as he protected Israel in the wilderness with a pillar of fire and a pillar of smoke, remember that? At the end of the millennium, you see, the devil is going to try, is going to, he's going to be loosed out of his prison. He's going to be loosed out of the bottomless pit. And he's going to try and attack one more time. Let's look at Revelation 20 and, and look at this time period. In Revelation 20 and verse 1, this is the beginning of the, of the millennium in Revelation 20 and verse 1. It says, And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years, and cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed a little season. You see, he's going to be loosed at the end of the thousand years. And I saw thrones and they set upon them and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the, for, for the word of God and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years." And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth. So he's going to go out and deceive those nations that came through at the judgment of the nations, them ones that were coming to worship the Lord at Jerusalem during the Feast of Tabernacles. He's going to go out and deceive them to gather them together to battle the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about and the beloved city. But look what happens. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. So it could be that that fire that's protecting the city is the same fire that comes down and devours the devil and his army. Just speculation. The build-up to Satan gathering the army is obviously going to be very dramatic and deceptive, but the battle doesn't seem to last very long. By this point, it's like the Lord is just bored of using the devil as a puppet and just says, flame on and just devours him. But that's some people have speculated that that could be what this verse is talking about. Is that the the Lord's going to use that devouring fire, that or that devouring fire is going to come from that fire that's protecting the beloved city. Isaiah four six, and there shall be a tabernacle for a shadow in the daytime from the heat, and for a place of refuge, and for a covert 
from storm and from rain. So, once again, tabernacle. That word appears 107 times in the book of Numbers. So, once again, you got Numbers and Isaiah 4 matching up. It, the word tabernacle actually appears more in Numbers than any other book in the Bible. And it appears three times in Isaiah. And some guys believe that Isaiah 4, 6 actually goes backwards in time before the millennium. Because you know how Isaiah, he, he switches back and forth from millennium to tribulation. They believe this first goes back into the tribulation where the sun is scorching men with great heat. As in Revelation 16, 9. And they say this verse is referring to God preserving his people through that time by giving them a shadow from that scorching heat. So that could be. But I've also heard it taught that Noah's flood had shifted the earth from its orig original position. But the second advent is going to move it back to its original position, causing the earth to be a bit hotter after the second coming. But during the millennium, the Lord will have a shadow to protect them from the heat. That's something else I've heard. So, your guess is good as mine on that. But, overall, what you should realize is that no matter how bad things get in this present evil world, in the world to come, it's going to be ran by the Lord Jesus Christ, and He will be the greatest ruler, leader of all time. It will be the greatest time the world has ever seen. You're going to have an exalted Savior. No more sin being exalted. No more wicked men in power being exalted. You're going to have an exalted Savior. You're going to have excellent fruit. You're going to have escaped survivors. The saints of all ages coming through who escaped the, the temptations and the pleasures of this world. And you're going to have erased filth. We're going to start clean just like Noah did after the flood. You're going to have extra protection. Nobody that the Lord don't want in is coming in. It's going to have extra protection. It's going to be the greatest time the world has ever seen. But that is Isaiah chapter 4.